Well, good morning, everybody. My name is David. I'm the liturgist here at the church. But this morning, it's my privilege to deliver the sermon. And uh, I'm doing this sermon as the last sermon in our sermon series on humility. So I was asked to speak about humility, and so that got me thinking about different times in my life where I have been humbled, different times where I found myself in a state of humility. And it wasn't that hard to find a a lot of times where I had been humbled. But for some reason, there was a time in my life that just seemed like one of the peak eras of experiences of humility for me. And so when I was thinking about these times historically in my life, often I came back to my high school years. It was a time where I was often humbled. And I think that there's a reason for that. I think I was ripe for moments of being humbled in high school, uh, mostly because when I was in high school, I didn't focus all my energy on academics. I didn't focus on athletics. I focused really on being cool. That was the most important thing to me in high school, was finding ways of being cool. So I think you're ripe for finding moments of being humble when you have your uh, sights set at everyone thinking that you look cool. And I had some good moments. I did do some cool stuff in high school. I remember senior year, I got my first car. And it was a 1969 Cadillac Coupe de Ville. It was a gold Cadillac. And I would drive that thing on the streets of Mission Viejo thinking I was the coolest thing on the road. had this big V8 engine in it, this giant gold land yacht. It would set off car alarms as it went off because the rumbling of the engine was so big. And I would cruise with my hair slicked back listening to Johnny Cash. And I thought I was about as cool as you can get. Now, unfortunately, there's one issue with having a car from 1969. And that is that you will have, fairly often, some serious mechanical problems. So, unfortunately, what came along with having a 1969 Cadillac was about once a, uh, once a month you'd find me sitting on the side of the road with a broken down car. And these were moments of humility because there's nothing cooler than driving down the road in a Cadillac, but there's nothing less cool than sitting on the side of the road with a broken down car waiting for your mom to come pick you up. So this was a big moment of humility. I think back to another moment during my high school years when I was humbled. I was making this big purchase I was very excited about. Many of you will have had the same experience, uh, where I went to a store and I bought these vinyl pants. I'd been really looking forward to getting these black vinyl pants. Uh, They're very shiny. I thought I looked like a rock star when I wore them. So I was very excited about this. And I couldn't wait till I could go to school and wear my black, shiny vinyl pants to school and show everybody how cool I was. So the day comes, and I pull into the uh, student parking lot, and I pull in in my gold Cadillac, I get out of the car, and then I have a choice to make. You know, I got my black vinyl pants on, but I also, because it was the 90s and I was cool, had this long chain going to my wallet, between my wallet and my pocket. It almost came down to my knee. You know, these wallet chains weren't actually allowed on campus because, you know, they could think that maybe it's a weapon or something like that. So I had a choice. I could uh, either take off the wallet chain and put it, leave it in my car and There it would stay safely. Or I could take, well, it had to be about two pounds of metal chain, take it and then stuff it behind my wallet in my pocket so that they would be none the wiser, and then I could have my wallet chain on me. Well, that was the choice I made. So I stuffed the wallet chain in my back pocket, and it was bulging now with my wallet and this, you know, like I said, two pounds of chain. And then off I went on to school. And as I was walking around campus, I didn't realize that the weight of that chain was causing my vinyl pants 
uh, the pocket to rip, which was then causing the whole back panel of my pants to rip open. So I had a giant hole in the back of my pants as I was walking around high school. And this was pointed out to me by other high schoolers. You wouldn't be surprised that they were very happy to point that out to me. Uh, and I was the victim of many jeers and laughs. And I have to be honest, when I think back even then, I remember looking down at my vinyl pants, uh, something that was already getting me a lot of attention, then looking at the big hole in the back of them, and then I'd hear the jeers and kind of go, well, I think I was asking for that one. And that was a feeling of humility. Uh, I knew I wasn't the coolest guy on campus right at that moment. Um, now, those are kind of funny moments of humility uh, from my high school years. Uh, and I, and I foc it didn't make me lose focus on being cool, though. I was the cool guy driving the Cadillac during high school and college. I was playing in rock and roll bands all around Los Angeles. But then, as I got older, I entered into a new identity from going from being the cool high schooler to the, to the rock and roll singer to now a dad. You see, one of the most humbling experiences of my life has been the experience of parenthood. You know, instead of being the guy driving down the road in his Cadillac listening to Johnny Cash, now I drive a Honda CRV and listen to Kids Bop. For those of you that don't know what Kids Bop is, it's top 40 hits of today as sung by children. This is not necessarily the coolest thing to be cruising down the street listening to in uh, your soccer mom car. However, my son, Hezzy, loves Kids Bop, and he often demands it, so I put it on, and I live through this humbling experience. Uh, the way that humility is just kind of built into uh, the life of a parent was reminded uh, to me uh, last week as my wife asked me if I would hang a curtain rod in our living room. And so this is actually a good moment for me to maybe show off uh, my more manly skills. It, it's, not, it's a very modest domestic chore, but still I have to hang a curtain rod, meaning I have to get out the drywall anchors, and that means I have to get out my power drill, and I have to get out the level to make sure I measure everything. So, you know, I'm setting up my toolbox and all my kind of manly tools, and while I'm doing that, my wife and son are setting up their little spot on the couch uh, to watch me. They have a little blanket to get cozy as they watch. They have uh, a little snack that they can have as they watch. Now, at first, you're thinking, well, that's darling. And they're gathering around to admire uh, me as I do this manly chore. But actually, what they're waiting for are the mistakes I make. Because whenever I make a mistake, like I'm holding up a screw and I drop it, and, then I, and I'm holding something else awkwardly, and I go, dang it, then they laugh. That's the big payoff for them. Or when I measure something, then I screw it in here, and I screw it in here, then I realize it's all tilted, then I get upset, they laugh again. That's the fun part for them. So I can't feel too manly or feel too impressive because I have these two uh, keeping me on check and keeping me humble. That's a bit of what my life has become. But the most humbling aspect of parenthood, in all seriousness, it's something I didn't expect. It's this almost painful feeling of love that I have when I look at my son. I say it's almost painful because it's this feeling of loving someone so much who seems so fragile. And you feel such a yearning need to take care of them. And it creates this truly humbling, almost heart-rending mixture of love and fear and responsibility. But there's been a blessing, there's been many blessings to that love. It's humbling, but sometimes when I look at my son and I realize how much I unconditionally love him and how humbling that feeling is that my heart has almost been 
split apart and a piece of my soul now resides in him, when I feel all those emotions, I realize that even these intense emotions are just a glimpse of the type of love that my heavenly Father has for me. And I better understand how God looks at me. And I think he must look at me with a similar type of love. And I'm happy to live humbly before my son and family, and that's because I have this kind of love for them. The love I feel for them urges me to live humbly in service before them, to live humbled in love. And that brings us to our focus text today. And in this scripture that we'll be reading, we see a moment where Jesus performs an act of humility. And we'll see how this humility is born out of the same kind of love I'm talking about. This almost heart-rending love that so draws us to take care of someone. And Jesus shows us how true humility is born out of love. And as we read, we'll see that he encourages us to humbly love each other in this way. So you can open up your Bibles if you have them at home. Uh, And we're going to be reading from the book of John in chapter 13, where we see this act of humility. And it takes place the night before Jesus' crucifixion, when he's in the upper room with his disciples. Uh, very beginning of John chapter 13. So let's read this together, not only to see what Jesus does, but what I think is going to be the important context of why he does it. So beginning in John chapter 13, verse 1. It was just before the Passover festival. Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The evening meal was in progress, and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power, and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, You do not realize now what I am doing, but later you will understand. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered, Unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Then, Lord, Simon Peter replied, Not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. Jesus answered, Those who have had a bath need only to wash their feet. Their whole body is clean, and you are clean, though not every one of you. For he knew who was going to betray him, and that was why he said not everyone was clean. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I have done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have, asked, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Very truly I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you'll be blessed if you do them. So we have this wonderful depiction of the lengths of Jesus' love, of how he will humble himself before his disciples. Humble himself in a dramatic way. The act of washing a guest's feet was reserved for servants or even slaves at this time. And Jesus is the one taking on this role. 
But I think it's important that we pay attention to the context in which he does it. Before the description of Jesus washing his disciples' feet, we're treated to a picture of the way he looks upon them with love. And this is the catalyst for that humble action. In verse 1, it read, Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. These were his own, it says. You see, these were the disciples, his followers. This was his family. Jesus was an unmarried man, had no children. But for the last several years, he's been on the road with this small group of people. We can imagine how close they were to each other and how deeply he loved them. And yet it seems that his love here is mixed also with this pain of knowing that he has to leave them soon. This heart-rending pain he must have felt. You see, when I read this, as I read it several times, there was something in, in it, in that picture of Jesus looking at these disciples, that he'll soon leave. There must have been some fear of how will they take care of themselves when I'm gone. This unconditional love that he had for them. And it reminded me, of course, of that love that I have for my son. And I've had trouble describing what that love is. I use this word heartrending. I don't know if that sounds too negative. It just means that there's a, a certain amount of pain in the strength of it. And it actually caused me to do something something which I, I feel somewhat proud of, it makes me feel like a, a real preacher, was that I, I said, I should look up the Greek word for what this love is. So I actually looked up the Greek words in the passage. That's where uh, I feel legit now. And you see, the Greek word for the love Jesus feels in this verse is agapesis, or agape love. Now, there's several different types of love in Greek, there's the love, there's words that describe the love that, uh, you know, th th that has romantic love. Uh, there's love that you feel between friends, brotherly love. But this agape love is reserved for a type of love that's the unconditional, sacrificial love that's used to describe the type of love that God has for us as our Heavenly Father. And this is the type of love that Jesus looks upon His disciples with. And it seems that, at least in a small way, it seems like the best way of describing that heart-rending type of love I was describing that I felt for my son. And now as we read this story about Jesus, we see that it's out of this type of love, of looking at his disciples with this feeling of agape love, that spurs him on to this action of humility. Picking up in verse 3, it's written, Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power, and that he had come from God and was returning to God. Again, he's remembering, I have to leave soon. I'm returning to the Father. So, and I like how just that word so places us in the narrative. He thought about this. He was looking with love on his, at his disciples. Knew that he had to leave. So, what does he do? He got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. We've been talking a lot about humility, and we see this act of great humility on the part of Jesus, but we're reminded that this humility needs to be rooted in the feeling of love. It's Jesus' love for his disciples that causes him to humble himself in this way. 
And he explains that it's not just because he loves them that he does this, but because he wants us to love each other in this same way. When Jesus explains uh, to the disciples why he does th- did this, he says this. So picking up in verse 12, when he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I have done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Very truly I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. You see, just as Jesus was called to humble service due to his feeling of love for his disciples, his disciples are called to engage in this type of humble service with each other. And our treatment of each other, shown by this humble service in Jesus' example of the washing of the feet, is something that needs to be rooted in that same type of love that Jesus felt for his disciples. Now this all comes to connect a couple chapters later in John chapter 15. Jesus again tells them that they need to take care of each other. That they need to love each other with sacrificial love. In John chapter 15, starting at verse 9, this is what Jesus says to his disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. I pause there because there's that sacrifice that's part of this agape love. And it connects back to him sacrificing his station in life to humble himself down to wash his feet. And this has been described as purposefully on Jesus' part to be a representation of the way he's going to humble himself on the cross. And again, it's all rooted in this love that he speaks of in John 15. You are my friends, he goes on in uh, verse 14. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends for everything that I learned from my father I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit. Fruit that will last, and so that whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. This is my command. Love each other. Two chapters before, wash each other's feet. Live in humble love with each other. And this passage in chapter 15 is permeated with that type of humble love, both spiritually and verbally, because the love in Greek that's used throughout this passage is agape love. That sacrificial, unconditional love. It's the love that exists between the Father and the Son, as Jesus said, as the Father has loved me. And it exists between Jesus and us. So have I loved you. And we are commanded to extend the same type of agape love, the the sacrificial, unconditional love that the Father has for the Son to each other. He says, this is my command, love each other. And the love that he's using is the word for the same love that's God's love. The love of a heavenly Father. That agape love, that heart-rending, sacrificial love we are commanded to love each other with. 
That same word for love describing how Jesus felt that prompted him to wash his disciples' feet in an act of humble service. It's the same word for love that appears in a verse we all know that shows the sacrificial nature of God's love. For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son that whoever believes in Him shall not perish but have eternal life. And we are meant to imitate this love. We are meant to join in to this relationship of love. And there's something mysterious and beautiful in the way that we're invited to imitate the example of love between the Father and Son. That agape love that Jesus showed to His disciples was shown in that moment when Jesus washes His disciples' feet. And that moment is what theologian RVG Tasker calls an acted parable. And I love that phrase, acted parable. We know what a parable is. It's a story. It's a story that has greater meaning. But this is an acted parable. And it's a story that Jesus is acting out there with his disciple that invites his disciples into the story as he acts it out. It's interactive. Did you know that Christianity is interactive? So this demonstration of humble love This acted parable is a story that Jesus included his disciples in and that they went and retold through their actions to those that they led. It became a love shared and repeated by those followers to their communities. The love repeated again to others through humble service again and again throughout the ages, becoming a forever mirror Reflecting the love that establishes God's kingdom here on earth as it is in heaven. And that is the goal of our humility towards each other. Our humility is how the glory of the kingdom is ushered in. So as we conclude this humbled series, And we look toward living lives in humble service to each other. Let us remember that these lives of humble love that we are called to uh, live out must be based in our knowledge of the love that God has for us. You see, Jesus did not just give his disciples an example of his love. After he washes their feet, he does say this is an example. I want you to do this. But he also gave them an experience of his love. The touch of his hand on their feet was a tender, intimate, physical experience to let them feel that Jesus loved them. And we need this love ourselves of Jesus. And we need it to be a felt love that permeates our hearts so that we, rooted in the knowledge of the Father's love for us, can, humbled in love, do the work of His kingdom by loving each other. And so as I close in prayer, I'm going to do something a little different. I want to end in a bit of silence with an invitation. And so as you're watching at home, I invite you to maybe close your eyes. You can even raise your hands up in acceptance of a gift that's coming. And I invite you to open your heart. And I'm going to pray over us, over this congregation, for the Holy Spirit to make that agape love that God has for you a felt reality. Something you feel real in your heart today. So let's pray. 
Lord Jesus, we know that you love us. Lord Jesus, we know that you are here. We know that you are real. And we know that your Holy Spirit can be felt in our hearts today. We want to follow your word. We want to follow your example. But we want to feel your love. And I just pray over the hearts of everyone watching now that the presence of the Holy Spirit would descend upon them and would fill their minds and their hearts now. I just pray for that agape love, the unconditional, passionate love of God to rain down on the hearts of everyone listening today. Heavenly Father, we know you are good and you are faithful. And we pray that your love would stay with us. And as Jesus said, you would allow us to remain in your love. In the name of Jesus, amen.